you can hear me, you can be quiet. <laughs> all right. I am my mother's daughter. Okay. So, all right. Can you hear me? Good, good. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about how to jumpstart your kids in tech because I met a few people here who actually have kids. Well, yeah, some people have kids, and uh, <laughs> you probably want to put your kids in tech. So, um, a little bit about me. I have four siblings. My mother is Mickey Rosenny. You probably heard her talk earlier today. I, um, I love athletics. I play a lot of sports. I went to college early. And um, my strength is my weakness. I love to learn things, which causes me sometimes to, like, open up ten books and not finish one of them. <laughs> yes, so my mom um, is my mentor. And she taught me, she started teaching me programming from a young age. Nothing involved. I, sh one day, she, when I was 12, she started playing with me, uh, playing on the terminal with me and telling me how to change directories, list the files in your directory, and so on. And <clears throat> I thought that was fun, and I used to think that computers were scary, but having these small little introductory activities made it not scary when I got to college. So here are some pointers when you're trying to get your kids interested or not scared of technology. One, introduce the kids to small things, nothing big. So how to play with the command line, uh, little HTML introductory classes, but do it with them so they can have fun and enjoy it, and then talk about it with them, talk tech with them, um, and then you want to apply that. So I tutor math. Uh, one of my students, her name is Skyla. She is four grades behind. So she was, she's supposed to be in fourth grade, but she's in first grade. And I have almost got her up to date in the past three months. I've almost brought her from first grade math to fourth grade math. She's really smart. It's just sometimes kids don't know, they don't feel like they can do it. So once you show the kid that they can do it, it's possible, they, they feel very strong. And so they keep going, and they learn, and they have a passion. So talk about it with your kids and help them apply um, whatever they're studying to, uh, to, to um, life. So I give her real life examples of math. Mom would give me real-life examples of technology. When I would go to conferences with her when I was young, I learned that you could literally take programming and make programs to teach kids so they could, like, download apps and have, actually have fun learning, which, what a concept. And uh, then just tell the kids that they can do it. Don't tell them that they can't do it. Tell them that you know, math sucks sometimes. English sucks sometimes. Technology, I, you don't understand it sometimes, but you can do it. And you'd be surprised at how far this gets kids. It got me pretty far. I went into an engineering program I did not think I could complete. And I did, because my parents told me that I could do it. And I had many people tell me that I was stupid, but I am. I just got through the program. <laughs> um, so that day I was playing with the terminal with my mom. I remember changing directories, and then my mom recalls me looking up at her and saying, I feel so smart. <laughs> um, that's the response you want out of your kids. That's, you know, you want them to enjoy it, and you want to enjoy it with them, and it creates memories. If you don't have kids, you can still do this. I brought one of my friends into tech. And he is mentoring underneath my mother. And I will help him problem solve some questions. I also tutor young kids. So there's always ways to mentor opportunities, whether it's in tech or math. But mostly you want to teach them to love it and that it's not, it's, it's not just work. It's applicable to life. Um, that's, that's all I had. Uh, do you have any questions? Actually, I'm out of time. Oh, yes, yes. Also, also, I'm looking for a job, so let's talk. Let's connect. <laughs> All right. My name is... Oh, hold on. Thank you. <laughs> my parents never told me that, so that means a lot. Um, my name is Andy Glassman. I'm a back, senior backend engineer at Sway DM. 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter, it's very quiet there, or on GitHub, uh, you probably have seen me around the Elixir Slack as well. So raise your hand if you watched The Queen's Gambit. All right, now keep your hand up if you decided you needed to program a chess game directly after watching it. <laughs> Nobody, okay. <laughs> I guess it was just me. So I, w I was just, uh, I was getting in more into Elixir, and I'm like, I really got to try to make a chess game in Elixir. Um, so I started with just making like a complete back-end game that you could maybe hook into Slack or something. So I represented the location of all the pieces using a map and the current color that uh, turn it was to move and the previous moves. <coughs> and then I also created a lot of types. Uh, basically, it was just trying to take the brain dump of everything I knew about chess and things that I had read about and put it into... The, the app and try to give myself some guardrails. So you have different, the colors, the different pieces, the positions, the starting material, and all these different things. And then programmatically create the initial state. Um, I have all this on GitHub, so don't look at it too closely. So I also created a, I was like, well, if you have the game state, you're gonna wanna be able to read it in and out of different uh, representations. So we wanna be able to take a string and turn it into the game state, or take a game state and turn it into a string. So we came up, I came up with this notation behavior. Um, and the first one I implemented was the Forsyth Edwards notation, which ends up looking like this, which represents the, the different pieces and where they are, and there's, if there's spaces or not. Um, one of the issues I ran into with this is that the special notation um, also notes if castling is possible, and castling is a move where you can move the rook and swap it with the king or queen. I don't know, it's been a while since I wrote it. <laughs> but then I was like, well, great, now I have to figure out if castling is possible before I even wrote the game. Um, so that's kind of how this, this app progressed, is I would try to write something and I'd learn a new rule about chess and then I'd have to code it. Um, one of the bonuses, though, is that the ch this website I found called chessboardimage.com supports rendering this notation into a ping. Um, and I'll show what that looks like later. So the one that I wanted to do for Slack was like a Unicode representation, and because there are chess piece Unicode uh, characters. So this is what the output and input looks like. You can, you can make a, a here doc, basically, of this um, board and it'll read it into the game state. And that gives you an easy way to like represent different states in your unit tests. So if you have a scenario in chess that you want to run against a few states, um, I thought you were saying peace. Uh, <laughs> um, if you want to have like a specific scenario to put together, you don't have to like think about, okay, what actually is the position of this one and this one? You can just basically make a little picture of it. And then you can render it to that state. Um, this is what like a test would look like. So I, I knit the chessboard, I make a move, and then I render it, and here's what I'm expecting, and then we assert if the expected equals the output. So that makes the tests very easy to read. This is what you would get if you render it with that chessboard image renderer, and you can even put in the last move and it'll highlight it in green. <clears throat> Um, and so when you're playing the game, this is or when you're coding the game, this is essentially what it looks like. You init, and then you move, and it'll give you errors if you try to make an invalid move. So basically the game loop is try to make a move, um, move the piece, and then the next player. So I don't have everything coded here like win conditions yet. I started just by using uh, pattern matching and function heads to go through all the valid moves. So start, I started with the pawn movements. So is this, but then of course there's weird rules around pawns, can you move one or two spaces? Well, that depends on if other people have moved different things in your path, or if you've moved that one before. And then it, there's also en passant, which is like basically capturing a piece moving diagonally. So then right off the bat, I'm, I'm hitting all the hard rules. Um, and then also the castling. So uh, it was kind of fun to work through that and, and understand chess a little bit better, even though I'm terrible at playing it. Um, so, take a look at the repo and talk to me afterwards if you're interested in hearing more. Thanks. So, uh, serializing ectoschemas into JSON the lazy way. Um, so, basically, here's what we're going to do. Uh, the normal way, 
looks kind of like this in Phoenix. Uh, dang, this is like so small. Oh well. So at the very bottom here, like people who have done Phoenix are pretty familiar with this. You have your error.json and you pass in your change set or you pass in some sort of struct. And then um, you can use it like that. Uh, in, in, in your view, you call it, you uh, pattern match an error.json of the function head, and then you kind of do what you want with it, right? That's all well and good, and that's like, it gives like defined boundaries for where you want your, like, uh, how you want your, your schemas to be serialized and stuff like that. That's, that's great. But what if you wanted to do it in a way that has more technical debt and is worse? Um, yeah. And I, and th these are the thoughts that I think about. And so, um, the, so that's, that's, uh, that's where I invented kind of the lazy way. And the way that works is um, I, I made this thing called it. So Kathleen is the name of our application. It's a banking application. Kathleen just sounded like a lady that works at a bank, which is why it's named Kathleen. Um, so I defined an encoder. I module and I just I the, so there's an option where you can like drop IDs from here and then basically all all it does and I, I can explain this code is I you use it and um, it's basically just a very simple macro that defines an encode function that basically goes through every single one of the associations and uh, the main and, and the main things on the schema and then. Um, Either I, I, and if that schema, if that association is loaded, it um, it serializes it. Otherwise, it uh, it doesn't serialize it, um, and it just adds like an empty map or an empty uh, list in this cardinality to empty uh, section right here. And then it does the JSON encode. And so I'm basically just uh, implementing a JSON encoder for um, any module that calls use on this thing. So the way that it works in practice is this is like. This, uh, I'm opening the Komodo here a little bit. This is like actual production code here. Um, I, we have our we have like a show I, um, endpoint, um, and we basically get a loan application for a user, and then we do some stuff on it, and then we just call JSON, and we don't need to write a view, and we don't need to do any of that kind of stuff, and it's probably a worse idea. But guess who doesn't have to write any views anymore? This guy. Um, and so I uh, yeah. Um, and then it, it, this, this is like an output. This is like an example output from like a, a dev server. It follows all the associations. It loads like uh, one to many's, many to many's. It does it all for you. And uh, yeah, um, I'm uh, I'm happier uh, now because I didn't like writing those views. Those were uh, tedious. So um, that is uh, a GitHub gist with the encoder in there. If you guys want to be like me and do things poorly. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, uh, that's my talk. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't realize we were supposed to have a PowerPoint, but maybe we weren't. But So I'm just going to show some code here. Um, but I just wanted to share a pattern that I have enjoyed using that I don't see really at all in the Elixir community. Um, and that is that we co-locate all of our tests next to the file they are actually testing. We do not put them in the test directory. So, <laughs> so now a couple of reasons for this. Um, main benefit is when you have a new team member come on, when they need to write a test for something they are adding, they know exactly where it is, if there is an existing file or if there isn't one, to add one. Um, a lot of times you'll refactor your code, rename a file, change directory structure, but you forget to do that for your tests. And so now you have no idea where your test is that is testing your code. Um, another benefit I really found is GitHub code reviews. Your tests are right next to the code that you just added. And so you can check the functionality, make sure somebody actually added a unit test, and then understand their function better by looking at the unit test instead of having to scroll all the way to the bottom of the review to match the test to the code that they just added. Um, let's see. So uh, it's actually really easy to do this in Elixir. Um, in your mix.exs, you just add a test paths key. Um, if you are, you can migrate over time and add the test directory and lib here. Um, we have got everything migrated over, so we only run tests um, out of test paths. Um, one person, uh, when I brought this idea up to them, was concerned about compiling. Um, but as, oh yeah, sorry. Better? Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah, so test pass, and then you just pass the, 
the name of the, the folder. Um, so yeah, so these files are not compiled um, as they are EXS files, and so you don't have to worry about that concern at all. So yeah, any questions? Yeah. Um, I have not run into an issue with, uh, you can't reference test files in anything, so. Uh, they are EX files, so they are not actually compiled, so you can't create a dependency into your actual code. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, just a library I've been working on. It's called Ice Cream. It's named after, a, it's, it's a port from a Python library of the same name. Uh, never use IO inspect again. Uh, my name is Joseph Lozano. I'm a senior software consultant at Testable. <laughs> Thank you. I'm on uh, Twitter at Joseph Lozano, underscores. There. So how many people have written code like this, this IO inspect, right? Everyone, right? Or, I thought I would have use of both hands. Um, or code like this, right, with your chain, oops, your chain of IO inspect. What goes on here? What's going on here? What's going on here? And what's going on here? Right, Everyone, everyone's done this. So I'm in the process of writing this library it's called Ice Cream. You access it by going onto my computer. Uh, one, <laughs> <laughs> one directory up. <laughs> I'm hoping to get this on. I have, I have the, the, the hex kind of reserved, so hopefully this comes out pretty soon. Come talk to me and tell me to you know, actually get around to it. Um, and the way it works is we could delete this. We could write IC and user params, uh, but also use capital I ice cream tab complete and what that will give us is I kind of have just a, a thing up here um, prints out for you I see little bar user params prints it out for you no having to worry about a label no no having to do anything and it works just as easily um, in here, so we could replace all of these with typing with one hand is not a skill that I've practiced. Do you mind? Sorry, thank you. You got plenty of time. So let me just clear this to get it renewed. And yeah, it just right now for you, you can see it at the top. We have that. Is that big enough? User params are printed out. The user struct user dot registration change set. It just it just prints out the labels for you automatically. Um, it's also pretty configurable. Uh, but so if you wanted to, for example, pass in location true um, and rerun this. As you can see here, for the user struct, it will also have printed out, where is it? Yeah, the location, you know, that it is. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm, this, is, this is a work in progress. Um, yeah, I don't know, any, any questions? Anyone? <laughs> There is the version. The version. The version that is on on hex is mostly is mostly there. I'm mostly just needing to do documentation, and sometimes you get the squigglies in VS Code, and I would very much like to make those go away. So if anyone if anyone's an expert in Elixir LS and wants to help me with that, that would be very much appreciated. Um, oh, one thing I did forget too is that if you don't if you want the location true always, you could just hop into config. Um, do your config. Uh, I'd have to restart the thing, uh, but you know you could have a, you could have same defaults or different defaults if you'd like as well. So yeah, I'm going to try to get this out hopefully this week or next. Um, yeah. I, I 
I've been working for like minutes on this presentation. Um, so we had a legacy app written in Rails. Um, it helps people get ahead in their careers and we had a resume builder and it was quite slow and it was built with jQuery, it was old technology and uh, it was really one fun to work with. And um, I got excited one day and said, you know, let's try our first project as something in Elixir of making something much more robust. And um, this is one of my first Elixir projects um, a few years back. And so we decided to build this resume builder that makes it really easy for someone to come in and say, hey, I'm making my resume, I'm a senior engineer, and everything's live, everything updates pretty easily. Um, and so this is a combination of a really simple Elixir backend API and a view app um, with a unique templating engine that makes it so if you wanna change um, the entire design of your resume, with one click you can do that. Um, and so this has been a really handy tool. Over 12,000 people have made resumes this way. Um, and lots of them have gotten jobs because built into the design of the application, we provide hints on what you should put in the content. Um, a couple of the interesting things I like about the development, um, there's actually two apps running on this screen. So there's the editor app on the left-hand side, and hold on one second. Um, and on the right-hand side, there's a display app. Um, and so what that does, to make this really simple, the editor is just passing the latest values to the display app. So I separated the concerns of how do you render and you know you display a resume with how do you edit one. So um, this makes the production of PDFs really easy because I have a single page to say, hey, let me display this and turn it into a resume. Um, and, you know, it has, has fancy things where you can come in and you know add your experience, um, you know, uh, whatever you have, uh, you know, uh, fire festival it was my favorite job. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, so a couple of the, the cool coding things we did. So I want to uh, preface this with I completely hate JavaScript. It's annoying. Uh, and this is coming from someone who used to be a front-end engineer. Um, there's, and so a lot of the ways I build apps is having them single page apps, which means instead of having to deal with uh, Node and packing and unbundling all this stuff, I just load things on the page. With Phoenix, um, you can have things in your head of your file. Um, where is this? Uh -oh. and make it so that it loads specific um, applications and files only if they're there. So this is kind of handy. What's it saying? It's, it's only going to load this um, scripts file on this page if it exists, like render existing. Oh, two, two minutes. Um, and then this is a very simple view app, and all we're doing is passing the JSON API that um, you know, Phoenix has built in all these you know typical resume fields. It's a pretty flat set of data, so it's pretty easy to manage, and then this is less than 300 lines of code. So um, really efficient. Uh, I really like working with Vue and um, Elixir because I think Vue is very lightweight. Um, if I were totally want to nerd out, the next version of this will probably be built, be built in Live Vue. Um, but uh, yeah, that's basically it. Any questions? Okay. All right, I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. I'm not gonna do a tech talk. So I am a Elixir engineer, but uh, I'm trying something different. So I'm gonna kinda go through the difficulty of hiring Elixir engineers. So I work at a company right now and I'm trying to hire people and it is challenging. Anybody else, can I get a woo if you guys are going through that same process? Like, it's a little bit tough, right? And then I'm from the other side, like, it's also tough to find a job sometimes. So I'm kinda just gonna run through run through those difficulties from both perspectives and, and we'll kind of just come to some com, come to some conclusions here. So, um, you know, in my current job, I have to try to reach out to people and um, and get them to, to try to apply to our, our company, right? Like I have to sell my company for these people. Um, and then on top of that, so like, let's say we use a recruiter, right? Like my company wants to hire somebody, I use a recruiter and they give me potential candidates, sweet. Maybe I give them some questions to, to vet these candidates or whatnot, but I'm still involved in that process. Then my company says, all right, well now we need to, uh, now we need to get these candidates and have you properly vet them. Okay, so who's gonna do that? Well, it's me, the developer, right? Like, 
I'm over here, I'm trying to write code, and my company's having me go into these interviews and try to vet these candidates, and, and that's a difficult process, right? Like, that's, that's frustrating for me. That's, that's a waste of my company's time and resources. Like, I should be working in my team, writing code, deploying code, but yet I'm being pulled out trying to work on growing my team, and, you know, especially in smaller teams, like, this is difficult, right? This is a challenging problem. Um, and a lot of cases I've seen, like, at, at companies I've worked for even, if this process isn't built out and executed properly, like we end up set settling for, for candidates that are kind of subpar, maybe they, they don't have the right qualifications or whatever it might be, right? Um, now let's look at it from, from the other perspective. So this is me as a developer, like I wanna go look for another job for whatever reason, right? Maybe I don't have a job, maybe I'm, I'm looking for a change or whatever, maybe I just wanna go work for, with Elixir, right? Um, so this is gonna be, I have to apply to companies that I know are using Elixir. And so uh, this is going to be, uh, I know as a developer, it's going to be a numbers game, right? So I'm going to apply to as many companies as I can. Maybe I get uh, five interviews from that. So that's five different interviews at different companies who have different processes. And I have to go through the headache of each one. And it's frustrating. And on top of that, it's kind of like a, a part-time job, right? Like I already have a full-time job and I'm trying to look for a new one. I have to take on maybe 10, 15, 20 hours of applying and interviewing and going through these different processes. And, and it might not all work out, right? Like maybe only one of them works out and I wasted kind of a bunch of time. So what if, as a developer, you could go and apply at one place, go through one interview process, be vetted at, in, in one location, right? And then have access to a pool of all these companies that use Elixir. Um, I, I think that'd be pretty cool. And then what if as a company, right? What if me at my company, um, what if we were able to utilize someone who who already has this, this process built out, and then they can find and interview and place into my company these top tier Elixir engineers so that my team and, and us developers don't have to have our time and resources wasted doing that, right? Um, well, you know, so I've experienced this pain point quite a bit in my career. Um, I feel like I've interviewed thousands and thousands of developers, um, and, I, and I've placed at my companies dozens of those. And so, uh, you know, I, I've built out this company now to, to try to see if I can help other people solve these same problems with these processes that I've built out. Um, I, I think it, it's really needed. And so, if any of this resonates with you guys, you know, check us out. It's, uh, you can see up top left there, 10X developers, right? So it's 10EX, like Elixir file extensions, come out with the purple, dot dev. So, so go ahead and check us out. Uh, I'd love to talk with you guys, chat with you, just see if, if you have any pain points that maybe I can help you with or... Um, you know, we can kind of just grow together as a community and, and help solve this problem that we all have. All right, thank you so much. All right, so uh, earlier I talked about what I've been doing. Sorry. Uh, earlier I talked about what I've been doing over uh, Monday through Thursday for clients. Uh, right now I'm gonna talk, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. About some of the stuff I've been doing on my dockyard Fridays. Uh, project I've been working on is called Cobalt to Elixir. Uh, yeah, someone knows Cobalt here, apparently, which is uh, surprising. So, anyway, uh, I'm just going to run through this. is a live book that I, writ the, uh, that I wrote that's in the repo. You can uh, grab it and run it yourself. Uh, I'm just going to walk through this. So, uh, Cobalt to Elixir is a transpiler, it takes Cobalt code and writes Elixir code. Uh, and let's see, sorry, it, so it'll walk you through everything, setting up COBOL, uh, hopefully that'll be quick, yep, and then uh, verifying that that's there, this is, uh, details not super important, but anyway, so uh, you would, uh, if you were going to use COBOL to Elixir, you'd add that to your project, uh, in Livebook we can install that right away uh, with this uh, install command, so now in the Livebook, COBOL to Elixir is available, and so first what we're going to do is we're going to uh, create a variable that contains some basic COBOL code. As you can see, there's just some information there, program ID, author, date, uh, some data, and it's simply going to display hello and then the name. Name is, is current value Mike. So COBOL is, uh, so that's now in the COBOL variable. We can, uh, part of this project is the utilities to actually run this stuff. So uh, there's a utility to actually execute the COBOL code, which will take the COBOL code and compile it into COBOL um, byte, uh, binary and then run that binary. And so we can see if we run that, uh, what we get back is the output, uh, hello Mike, as we're, we're expecting. So now what we can do is we can say, okay, let's take that 
that COBOL code and convert it to Elixir code, and then we'll dump that out. And so what you'll see here is that we get a module back, the author and date written is all in, in your module docs. We've got, there's a, a bunch of boilerplate here that will be used in uh, some other, other features that aren't, aren't actually in this, uh, uh, that are in a more advanced code that's converted. But your basic code here is we have a variable name, a pick is in COBOL defines the, the data types. Uh, Mike is a name with a string, four characters. And the, uh, the uh, up here, uh, let's see, your display hello, na hello name is now uh, io.puts, hello, and then the variable name. Uh, yeah, so let's see, crash course through that. Um, so now we can uh, try, let's see, where are we? we can try running that Elixir code. So that's been, uh, that's been brought in. So, so that, that uh, let's see, we'll run that. Uh, using some uh, dynamic, dynamic loading here, uh, we load that, that Elixir code compile it and run it, and we get back hello Mike as the output. Obviously there's some warnings because the, the automated code is gonna have uh, not, not uh, ideal code. But anyway, uh, let's see. They, some of the other stuff we can do is we can do uh, paragraphs. Paragraphs in COBOL are similar to, similar to functions. So this is some COBOL code that uh, calls, starts with, starts with sub one, uh, displays that, will jump into sub two, and it basically bounces around in that. And so if we, uh, we execute that COBOL code, and we'll, this is the output that we're expecting, because this, this is what COBOL is actually doing, uh, then if we uh, convert that to Elixir, uh, you can see that what we, what we come out of this with is a call into each of these paragraphs, and then each of the paragraph is defined as it was in the COBOL code. Uh, and then the output, if we run that, is that the, we get, uh, we get the Elixir uh, output, and then we just, uh, for comparison, show the COBOL output. So this project not only converts COBOL to Elixir, but it also has the, the test hooks to run that, uh, in run code in COBOL, run the same code, in, or convert the code to Elixir, and then run that and compare the output and make sure that all the tests are, are good. Uh, if you're interested in it, the, uh, this is the, the repo, and it's up on hex. Uh, if you I uh, want to learn some more. I, there's a blog post out there on the Dockyard blog about this. Kind of goes more de more in depth into that. And if you're interested anymore, um, that's my Twitter uh, handle. So, all right. Yep. All right. Um. I'm fond of saying, and it's absolutely true, that this talk is my crowning professional achievement. I've never given it in five minutes. There is a quiz at the end, which I very much hope that we have time for, so here we go. Pasta party or noodle fiesta, the history and etymology of everybody's favorite food. So where does pasta come from? We know that Marco Polo brought it back from China, question mark. In 2005, archeologists uncovered a coil of dry noodles preserved for 4,000 years beneath an overturned earthenware bowl at a dig in northeastern China. Marco Polo traveled to China in 1292, super long time ago, and he wrote in his, I don't know, diary, I assume there's like a picture of a cat on it and glitter and stickers, he wrote about a macaroni-like dish that he ate there. So did he bring pasta back from China to Italy? What do you guys think, yes or no? Mmm, mixed, mixed room, mixed room. He did not. How do we know that he did not? He said a macaroni-like dish. He had a point of reference for noodles. All right, so let's talk about pasta in ancient times. So anybody know who the Etruscans are? Who are the Etruscans, Jeff? They did before the Roman people. There were the Etruscan people, which was like native tribes uh, on the Italian peninsula. So the ancient Etruscans actually made pasta by grinding cereals and grains and mixing it with water. And you see this is actually um, something that is real from real historic old times. Uh, an Etruscan tomb contains artwork with depictions of pasta making equipment. Uh, we also see some references to pasta in Greek mythology. Does anybody know who Hephaestus is? That's right. Well, um, no, kind of close. There is a hearth. Anybody else? Hephaestus? Hephaestus? This guy's doing something. Who's Hephaestus? 
Yeah, he's actually um, the Greek god of fire, volcanoes, and blacksmiths, which is why this gentleman was doing this thing. Uh, and he is said to have created a tool which made ribbons of pasta. Personally, I find that to be very believable. Okay, so ancient Greek cuisine. The ancient Greeks prepared a dish from pasta dough. They called it zimarika, and they cut it into long strips called laganon. Does laganon sound familiar to you guys? If I'm thinking pasta, laganon, lasagna, strips of pasta. We're making connections. They honored the dead by leaving macaria, macaroni, accompanied by olive oil and wine at the graveside. And they also conducted this ritual called the mercy meal. And it's still eaten today, I'm told by the internet, uh, at some Greek Orthodox funerals. This is, by the way, um, an original artwork by our very own Meryl Dakin. I don't know if she's taking commissions, but I recommend asking. Yeah, it's amazing, it's amazing. All right, moving on in history a little bit, we'll talk about pasta in ancient Naples. So the Greeks brought Lagane to Italy when they founded a colony at Naples. And Greek and Roman civilizations cultivated durum wheat, which is the basis of pasta dough. I got two minutes. Um, but ancient Etruscan, Greek, and Roman pastas weren't boiled. They were actually like baked in the sun, which is sort of what we do to lasagna, right? It's a baked pasta dish. So where did boil pasta come from? Hebrew and Arabic pasta. So the Jerusalem Talmud, which was written in Aramaic, which is the language that like people were speaking around the time of Jesus Christ. Uh, this was written in the 5th century AD. It is extremely old. It refers to boiling atria, which is an Arabic word for dried noodles. And these were brought to Sicily during the 8th century Arabic conquest of that place. So pasta in early medieval Sicily. We have Sicilian pasta dishes. They've got raisins and spices. They're very Middle Eastern influence, um, but it was super hard to make pasta because they had to like make it with their hands for hours all day. Uh, and their feet. This is real. This is how they needed pasta dough, just like with their dirty medieval times person feet. It was gross. Um, this is cool. This is a quote from someone called Al Adrisi, who was the geographer to the Norman king of Sicily in the 12th century. And he wrote, they produce an abundance of pasta in the shape of strings, which are exported everywhere. Pretty cool stuff. Moving on. Pasta in medieval Italy. This is the last of it. Um, so they made pasta in medieval Italy. But in medieval Italy, pasta was actually extremely expensive and fancy. It was made with like heaps of butter, a ton of sugar. It was a dish fit for like a king or a pope. And here is a little cookbook from the Pope's chef. And that's the Pope's kitchen. And this is actually my favorite quote. It's from Boccaccio's Decameron. And he writes, there is a mountain. This is like a dream, a fantasy that these people are having. There is a mountain made of Parmesan cheese with people on top of it who make ravioli and macaroni and cook them in good capon stock. And then the raviolis were tumbled down the side of the cheese mountain for everyone to enjoy, which sounds frankly amazing. <laughs> Delicious. All right, so moving ahead, pasta was industrialized. I'm wrapping it up. Um, it went from being a dish that was for rich, fancy people to being a dish for poor people all the way to today, and we're done. Yay, thank you. Uh, uh, well, hello, everybody. My name is Paul Statsny. I am here to tell you guys a tale about the last year or so. Um, writing a formatter for Surface UI from scratch without any prior experience. So this is a tale of uh, doing a little open source work. Uh, hopefully you come out of these next five minutes with uh, some encouragement to try out your hand at open source if you've never done that. Um, a little more familiarity with Surface if you haven't heard of that. And maybe some uh, desire to go use it. And uh, yeah, let's get going. So uh, what the heck is Surface? Surface, um, anybody know what Live View is? Yeah, yeah, I believe we all know what Live View is. Live View is pretty awesome. Surface uh, looks at Live View and goes, uh, there's a lot of people who really like libraries like React.js, you know, the, the, the API, the component API. Um, and so Surface says, we need a component API for Live View. Surface built that, uh, Marlis built that uh, through Surface. And our team uses Surface. And so building code in Live View uh, might look something like this, except replace all the dot, dot, dots in the class uh, with a bajillion um, CSS classes. And the nice thing with Surface is you can end up with something more like this, where you just a few keywords, and boom, you have the same amount of markup, but you don't have to repeat it all over the place. Um, you know, what's the best thing about Switzerland? I don't know, but the flag is a big plus. Um, so we got a little FAQ. Uh, component there. So our team uses Surface, and it's pretty great. 
it's it's a it's a great developer quality of life actually. Um, and we were building, uh, we were writing code that looked, I don't know, something like this. Certain uh, teammates, <coughs> more than others, um, weren't the most conscientious about code style. But who? So what's the what is the answer to code style arguments? Can anyone give me a formatter? Yeah. Let let a tool do it, okay? If if a tool is is deciding what the code looks like, then we can't argue about it, right? And it's great. So um, that's what we did. We wanted it to look more like that. And so what did I do? Um, I reached out to um, Marlis, the creator of Surface, and I said, uh, I think I'm going to try out making a formatter, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And so he said, Well, hey, uh, why don't you? Um, just run the parser that comes with Surface, and it's going to spit out um, some code that uh, spit out some AST that looks like this. So this is its like internal representation, um, and that's from maybe some code that looks like this. Give you guys a second to look at it, and it's going to spit out something like that, exactly that, because I ran it to get that, um, and so. Uh, long story short, because I don't really have time to explain how the formatter works or anything, um, a, a quick a quick high view of it, I've got two minutes, um, is we ended up with an architecture where we've got different phases. And the interesting thing, you'll notice the last phase is render, right? We're going to write it back to the file after reading it in and um, analyzing it. But you'll notice if you look at the names of these different phases, um, they're all really about white space. You know, new lines, tab, you know, tab indentation. Um, things like that, and it's inter it, that was one of my biggest like interesting takeaways from building the formatter is um, that's what formatters you know it's it's obvious in hindsight, but as you're building it, it's like okay, what is this code going to look like? What is it going to need to do? And you're kind of incrementally figuring it out. Well, formatting is just about just moving around the white space, right? And so um, what you end up with is the through those phases, you take this input um, AST, and you end up with something that looks like that. And you'll notice that. Largely the same thing, but we take these, uh, you know, these little strings of new lines and spaces and whatnot, and you end up with um, what we do is we replace them with atoms, uh, like new line, indent, etc. Um, so I think, yeah. And so after all of that, what we ended up with was the surface formatter, and that's awesome. And a uh, big shout out to my boss Joe Martinez for uh, supporting me, putting some work into that. Um, but really, what I want you to come out uh, from this talk again. Go try out things outside of your comfort zone. I had never worked on a formatter. Um, and you know, just reach out to the right people. Look for a, a problem that needs solved. And look for something that, you know, even if it's a little bit, you, know, you think it might be outside of your abilities. Try it out. You know, talk to people. Um, this is a great community, um, a really supportive open source community here in the, the Elixir um, ecosystem. Oh, and also go see um, Dave Lucia's Surface talk tomorrow, because that's going to be awesome. Also, if you want to be part of an awesome development team, uh, United Community Bank is hiring. Thanks, everybody.